Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on exploring implications for state policy in competency-based education. I'm Betsy Brand, Executive Director of the American Youth Policy Forum. For those of you who are unfamiliar with AYPF, we provide professional learning opportunities for national and state policymakers to learn about what works to help young people be successful by bridging policy, practice, and research. We cover issues such as secondary school reform, college and career readiness and success, dropout prevention and recovery, after school and expanded learning time, and youth development. Our focus is on the students who face challenges to success, such as those who are disadvantaged, students with disabilities, foster care youth, immigrant youth, and youth involved in the court system. Before we discuss today's topic, I want to provide a few logistical points about today's webinar. In the event of any technical difficulties, you may dial 1-800-263-6317 to reach GoToWebinar's technical support line. Again, that number is 1-800-263-6317. And if you happen to lose connectivity, please just go ahead and log back into the webinar. At any point during the webinar, you may type a question for our presenters in the questions box on your screen to the right, and we'll do our best to answer as many as we can. And please be sure to identify if the question is for a particular panelist. This webinar will be recorded, and the audio portion with all the slides will be posted on the AYPF website in one or two days. Also, when you exit the webinar, you will receive a very brief online survey about the webinar and its value to you. I encourage you to take a few moments to fill that out and send us your feedback as it helps us improve our programming. I also wanted to mention that AYPF will be hosting another webinar on competency-based education policies at the district level on July 16th from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. The speakers for that webinar will include Thomas Rooney, who's superintendent of the Lindsay Unified School District in California, Linda Laughlin, who is the superintendent of RSU 18 in Maine, and she's also the co-chair of the Maine Cohort for Customized Learning, and two researchers from the RAND Corporation, Matt Lewis and Jennifer Steele, who've been conducting research on how districts are using and developing competency-based education systems. So if you're interested in this topic today, I, I encourage you to check out the AYPF website to get more information on the forum on the 16th. AYPF is very happy to be co-sponsoring this webinar with our good partners at the College and Career Readiness and Success Center at AIR, AIR and you'll hear more about the center in just a moment. So today's webinar is about competency-based education and how states are designing, exploring, and implementing aspects of competency-based education and the policy challenges in this work. Competency-based education allows for transformation of our education system from a time-based system to a learner-based system. Competency education holds promise as states and districts explore new ways to expand and enrich support to students challenging the assumption that learning only takes place within the classroom and at particular times. Competency-based approaches are being used at all ages from elementary school to graduate school and they focus the attention of teachers, students, parents, and the broader community on how students can best master measurable learning topics. For the purposes of our discussion, you'll see a definition of competency-based education on your screen. This is taken from the competencyworks.org website, a group of organizations interested in promoting competency-based education. And I would encourage you to look at competencyworks.org uh, for information and tools about competency ed. Uh, I'm not going to read the definition on your screen. You can take a minute to look at that. Um, it gives you a good sense of the uh, main elements of competency-based education. And again, competencyworks.org is a rich resource for educators and policymakers, and please visit their website. So today's agenda um, is on the screen, and I will introduce the presenters in the order that they will be speaking. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Dr. Joe Harris, who's the director of the College and Career Readiness and Success Center at AIR, and he'll briefly review the work of the center. 
Next we'll hear from Kate Nielsen, who is a Policy Analyst, Education Division, Center for Best Practices at the National Governors Association. Kate will provide an overview of state activity on competency-based ed and some of the main policy challenges and issues states are exploring. Following Kate, we will hear from Diane Smith, who is the Director of Teaching and Learning Initiative with Oregon's Business Education Compact. She'll be followed by Sandra Dopp, who is the consultant for 21st Century Skills, Iowa Department of Education. And both Diana and Sandra will discuss how their states became involved with competency-based education and the approaches they have used to implement it in their states. Our final presenter will be Carissa Miller, Deputy Executive Director at the Council of Chief State School Officers. And Carissa will discuss an initiative at the Council of Chief State School Officers called the Innovation Lab Network, which is a network of 10 states all interested in trying new approaches to creating student-centered learning that involve competency-based ed. We'll have time for questions at various points in the panel and at the end, so please be sure to type in your questions in the box to the right on your computer screen. So at this point, uh, I'd like to turn the microphone over to Dr. Joe Harris. Uh, and Joe, are you available? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you great. Wonderful, wonderful. Thanks, Betsy. Um, we have such an exciting agenda, I'm going to be very brief talking about our center. Uh, we're one of seven content centers and 15 regional centers that comprise the Federal Comprehensive Centers Network that work with states in their respective districts and schools. As Betsy, indi Betsy indicated, we're housed at AIR with uh, AYPF and several others, including College Board, as our lead partners. The Comprehensive Center is a technical, the Comprehensive, I'm sorry, College and Career uh, Readiness and Success Center is a technical assistance hub that serves to promote co coordination and collaboration with other federal TA centers and external CCRS stakeholders and knowledge development through new products and tools, webinars and symposia, and our website and social media. Our priorities for the current year include mapping the CCRS landscape. Can I see next slide, please? Our priorities are mapping the CCRS landscape to promote common language and a common understanding, and, and to focus on post-secondary pathways for college and careers, and the alignment across all systems, PK through the workforce. To learn more about our center, I invite you to visit, next slide, I invite you to visit our website at ccrscenter.org where the uh, webinar for today and our previous webinars and upcoming webinars will also be housed so you can reach them through our center as well. Look forward to an exciting presentation and will be available for Q&A at the end as well. Thank you, Betsy. Great. Thank you, Joe. Really appreciate your taking time to give us a, a quick overview of the center. And it's a fabulous resource for those of you, particularly at the state level, that may not know about it. Please do check out the website that's up on your screen right now, loaded with uh, really useful and helpful tools and policy guidance. So um, now we're going to move to Kate Nielsen, who is from the National Governors Association. And she'll talk about the work of the NGA on competency ed. Kate, I'm turning it over to you. Great. Thanks, Betsy. Um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, wonderful to speak with all of you about competency-based education. I think that the governor holds a really unique role in this space. They're the only state individual to have oversight over the entire K to post-secondary pipeline. They really have their hand in a lot of different policy issues. I think it's really important that governors be abreast of what's going on in this field and help push the agenda. So with that, we can go to the first slide. I'd like to start by telling you all a little bit about where things are and state trends around competency-based education. Currently, about 36 states have some sort of flexibility policy on the books. That does not mean that all of them are acting upon it. Many have abolished the Carnegie unit, and some provide waivers to districts. Um, but for many, it's more up to individual districts or schools to really act on changing the system and implementing competency-based education. So we've seen a lot of school and district level innovation, but less at the full statewide level. There are, of course, a few outstanding states, and I'll show you a map in a minute, and we'll hear from some of them later on. But generally, that's the trend across the US, although there's certainly growing interest in this type of work. 
There's also been limited changes to the funding system, even if Carnegie units have been abolished. So that's an area where we're going to need some, to see some change if we're going to make really intensive change. There's also growing interest and overlap with other policy areas, with the Common Core state standards coming online and the assessments going live in 2015. There is a lot of opportunity um, to mesh competency-based education with that. Uh, the Common Core state standards were written as progressions, so they fit very nicely um, into a competency-based system. Similarly, dual enrollment um, and credit flexibility programs also mesh well with competency-based education and is a, is a place where there's a lot of policy overlap. We can move on to the next slide, please. This is a map just to give you a sense of what states are doing and how active they are. Um, those states that are red are the more advanced states. Uh, if you're having a little trouble reading it, these are the ones with clear policies that are moving towards competency-based education. The green states are the ones that are developing and, and maybe conducting pilots. And the yellow ones are emerging states that might have waivers or task forces to look into this. The ones that have the, the lines through them are ILM states. These are innovation lab network states brought together by CCSSO. That I believe Chris will speak more about later. That just gives you a sense of the lay of the land. Can move on to the next slide, please. With that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the work that NGA is doing in this field. Um, we just concluded a series of technical assistance grants to three different states to delve into this work a little bit more intensely. We worked with New Hampshire, Kentucky, and Pennsylvania. In New Hampshire, they wrote their waiver uh, for EFCA based around competency-based education, and we helped them put together a legislative summit to work on policies that would support that. In Kentucky, they also convened a summit. It, their summit was uh, more focused on communications um, and working with districts to really get a sense of what competency-based education is and what it looks like to be able to push it forward. And in Pennsylvania, they outlined a credit flex plan um, and push that through to the governor to include in his agenda. Also, we have some resources that I'd like to direct your attention to, and I believe the links will be sent out later so you don't have to scramble to write these down. But we have an issue brief on state strategies for awarding credit to support student learning. And I think it gives a very nice overview of what this looks like at the state level and some actions to take at the state level. We also have a policy audit that was put together by our colleague Chris Sturgis. Um, and it's a great way for states to assess where they are and where they might want to go and come up with a plan for implementing a competency-based system. And then finally, just last week, and Betsy was able to join us for this, um, we convened a competency-based education expert roundtable and conducted a day-long conversation where we explored several different elements with competency-based education and where we needed to push forward with this work. We explored gaps in knowledge and, and where there's a little bit more consensus. And it's going to inspire our work and hopefully our colleagues who are all in attendance there, their work going forward. So we're really excited about that. And I can talk a little bit more about our findings um, on the next slide uh, as we delve into major questions and issues. So the expert roundtable that we convened was set up around these three policy areas of human capital and providers, assessments and accountability, and funding. I've touched on funding just a touch. Um, but we think that these are three key areas to unlocking competency-based education. On the first one, what we spoke a lot about was the different roles for teachers and how to differentiate between them um, and think about using various skill sets uh, in unique ways. Uh, we also spoke a lot about access and making sure that all children have the same access to high-quality education. A huge part of preparing teachers to take on a competency-based education system is preparation and certification. So we need to think differently about how to prepare those teachers to be providers in the classroom. And also that teachers are not the only providers, thinking about who else comes into the school and which roles different, different adults serve. There's also obviously a great amount of overlap with evaluation and assessments. And these are going to be important transitions to, to, to note. Um, obviously, with the Common Core State Standard Assessments coming online in the 2014-15 school year, there's a lot of changes, and many states are also implementing changes in their evaluation systems at the same time. So that's a place where states need to sort of tread lightly 
and, and make sure that they have a, an overarching plan to implement that fully and faithfully. Also in regard to assessment and accountability, you need to be careful to note what is being assessed and how they're being account held accountable for it. So one test doesn't necessarily assess all things. Um, similarly, one test can't show um, what everyone should be held accountable for. So we need to differentiate uh, in that field as well. And finally, with funding, we need to figure out what exactly is needed. Some states are able to push forward with this work without drastic funding changes, and others might need some more large-scale changes. So I think this is an area where more research needs to be done to figure out what the best policy options are there. And other considerations that I think need to be on everyone's mind as we go forward with this work is how to bridge K-12 and post-secondary education. To the extent that students are motivated by the next step, um, they, we, it's, it'll be a lot easier to align policies on those two areas and make sure that we have excellent, high-quality education going on. And that plays into the, my next bullet point, um, access, equity, and excellence. We need to really make sure that these are systems that are serving all students, not just one particular population. And finally, effective use of data. It's, a, it's absolutely crucial that teachers and leaders are able to see what their students are learning and can learn from that data moving forward. And that'll be the best way for them to be able to provide the most high quality education. So with that, we can move to the next slide, and I'm happy to take any questions that people may have. Great. Um, Kate, thank you so much. Um, I, I do have a couple questions for you, and um, I just think it's important to get some of this background um, knowledge out. People are curious. So um, what is one question is, what is driving governor's interest in competency-based education? Like, why all of a sudden are they interested in this reform? Sure, absolutely. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, governors are in a unique position to oversee the entire birth to post-secondary and beyond pipeline. So I think it's, it's really important they're in a, in a driver's seat in that sense. But beyond that, governors are very concerned that they have well-educated populations who are able to contribute to the economy. Um, not all governors are education governors, but I'm pretty sure all of them our workforce governors and very concerned about their workforce. And the best way to have a, a high quality workforce is to have high quality education. So I think that governors see competency based education as a great way to make sure that their citizens are active and engaged and prepared for the workforce. Okay, that's great to know. Um, helpful to have some context for that. And another question is um, kind of based on your work with the states. Um, where are some of these states starting their work on competency-based education? Um, kind of what is the entry point? Is it curriculum? Is it professional development, assessments, or other, other areas? Well, I think it depends on the state, and it takes a, a combination of different things. Um, I noted the policy audit that Chris Sturgis just created, so I think that's a great place for states to start in assessing where they are. Um, I think many states are beginning with pilot programs um, to test out in districts. Um, it does certainly take a shift in how you teach. So, excuse me, professional development is a huge part of that. Um, I think it, it's also just about meeting students where they are, figuring out what they need, um, and then shaping curriculum around that. Um, the Common Source Core State Standards have also been a great catalyst. Because I think they're easy to unpack and understand and, and align with competencies. So as those are coming online, I think states are taking advantage of the opportunity um, to push forward with that work. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, I think your point about uh, starting where it makes sense uh, will be borne out by our next two speakers uh, who have very different pathways to using and um, implementing competency-based ed. So um, we're now going to switch to um, Diane Smith, who is the Director of Teaching and Learning um, with the Oregon's Business Education Compact. Um, and she's going to talk about their work on proficiency-based education, which is the language that Oregon uses uh, for competency-based based ed. So, Diane, I'm going to ask you to uh, take over the microphone. Thank you, and good morning. 
I'd like to thank the American Youth Policy Forum and all the sponsoring organizations for the opportunity to share Oregon's journey. The Business Education Compact, the organization I represent, is a 28-year young nonprofit with a goal to make real learning happen in every classroom through student and teacher internships, through STEM-related activities, and through proficiency-based teaching and learning. Next slide, please. You'll see from these bullets that Oregon's educational policies need to support improvement in all of these areas. We have a goal in our state called the 40-40-20 goal. Its intent is to move these percentages so that they are more positive. 100% will graduate from high school. 40% will go on to graduate from a four-year university. 40% from a community college and 20% into employment, trade, or military. Obviously this data continues to be the driving force for educational policy changes in Oregon and we hope to see that goal achieved by 2025. Next slide. Next slide please, thank you. This particular table shows the journey to reaching the point where Oregon is now. We saw the underpinnings of proficiency from 1993 to 2000 in the past college entrance system where students could apply to Oregon State Universities through a college admission system that was based on proficiency. While it was not successful for a variety of reasons, schools liked the important parts of the proficiency environment and the state asked for districts who would want to pilot the continuing components for opportunities for high school students to earn credit outside of the classroom or for prior learning as opposed to the Carnegie unit. Seven districts stepped forward and we began the pilot projects. 2005 was an important year because all of the comprehensive high schools in the state could then begin through a policy change to offer credit for not only what a student learned in the classroom, but also for what a student had previously learned and brought to the learning system, or what he might have learned outside of the classroom. For the first time by definition then, learning was no longer confined to 8 to 3 o'clock within four walls and only under the direct instruction of a teacher. At this point, the BEC took the lead for statewide professional development in all areas related to K-12 proficiency. Next slide. So looking at the rollout of proficiency in the state has allowed us to identify unique procedures to accommodate districts' needs. As you learned from the previous set of slides, there are multiple ways to enter the proficiency environment. Oregon has chosen to fund pilot sites to create momentum and interest. We did this through the Business Education Compact. The state provided money in the early 1990s and we then provide customized services and bring all interested educators together annually for our statewide proficiency conference. It's at this conference that we have the practitioner's voice, the student voice, the policy state voice, agencies that support teachers from the electronic gradebook to the uh, school board chair all talking about what does this look like and how can we sustain this. We invite you to attend the February 28, 2014 third annual statewide conference. We had 450 attend our conference last March and we uh, invite you to get a hold of me if you're interested for more information. Next slide please. Our goal is to put every teacher in every classroom in a position to comfortably use the elements of proficiency-based teaching and learning for every student. After four intense years with no state-level funding, these are the numbers of where we stand. You can clearly see that we have a long ways to go and we are beginning to pursue how state-level funding can help make this a possible uh, achievement. Next slide, please. Oregon educators expect that proficiency practices are supported with visionary leadership and challenges to the long-time status quo. So they cause us to look at different avenues to deliver a quality educational system. 
we know that critical elements of proficiency are appropriate for K-16 classrooms and all students should have access to them. We currently have aggressive policy in Oregon that requires teachers to report student proficiency in grade level standards and to separate behavior from academics. We also offer credit, as I said earlier, for learning completed prior to coming to class, as well as learning experiences that might take place outside of the classroom. Next slide, please. Our state leaders recognized that unless we could define what proficiency was, what it looked like, and how teachers could determine where they are on the continuum of implementation, that we would end up with the same kind of mixed bag of practices that we currently have. So we wanted to purposefully avoid this. We took almost two years and watched and listened to teachers across the state. In particular, we worked deeply with four districts and 150 teachers. We wanted to know what worked, what didn't. What did the research say? What did the data begin to say about student achievement? The result was a self-evaluation book of rubrics that focus on proficiency skills for the classroom teacher and student. We also heard loud and clear that teachers wanted to learn from one another. So the Business Education Compact keeps our eyes open for master teachers who embrace proficiency and can teach to others through effective adult engagement. We hire, train, and maintain coaching teams. We review their practices, we provide their names and opportunities for them to coach content area teachers across the state because it's really learning from other teachers that we make a good investment in sustainable change. Next slide please. In wrapping up, I want you to know what Oregon teachers value when it comes to effective professional development to support these policies what helps get them there, embrace the practices, and feel enough success to sustain the journey. The three components are that training must be regular and job embedded. Without it, we'll end up with as much variation as we currently have. Models, resources, and time for collaboration and development must also be made available. And we must have opportunities to feel success and to know that administrators support teachers, understand the conversations they're having with parents and students, and can be a consistent and supporting voice at the table. Next slide, please. I wanted to comment on, in particular, with students speaking out, the second bullet on this particular slide. Proficiency trumps cheating. It's a headline from a high school newspaper featuring proficiency at one of our local high schools. The point of the story was that based on student interviews, students felt no need to cheat in a proficiency-based classroom because the system was in place for them to be successful, to rise to the new expected levels of learning and achievement, and to make optimum growth. It was not about point chasing. It was only in the non-proficiency style classrooms where students felt that they were chasing these points to make the next grade level or to try it to get an advantage on an upcoming test. We think that this says a lot about the change of mentality that students begin bringing to proficiency-based classrooms. Next slide, please. This slide provides you several websites where you'll find support resources and samples of policy documents. I invite you to take a look at those to learn more about how the policy in Oregon is moving forward to support not only the high school options for credit, but the middle school and elementary options as well. Next slide, please. And of course, I'd be happy to provide information about our statewide proficiency rubrics, our professional development model, or provide copies of the outside evaluation completed as a result of the 18 months of work that we did with our four pilot sites and the 150 students, the teachers, the administrators, and school boards. It's been an honor to share Oregon's story with you, and I'd be happy to take questions later on in the webinar. Thank you. 
Thank you, Diane. That's great and a wonderful overview of Oregon's work on proficiency-based education. Um, I also just want to say an extra thank you to Diane. Um, she is in Hawaii where it is 7.30 a.m. Uh, and on her vacation, so we really appreciate her dedication to this topic. And uh, we will get to questions after we hear from our next speaker. So um, we are going to move on to our next speaker who's representing Iowa Department of Education. Uh, Sandra Dopp uh, is a consultant for 21st Century Skills and she's going to tell us about Iowa's approach to this work. So Sandra, you're on. Thank you, Betsy. And thank you to um, AYPF and CCRS Center for all that you're doing to promote this work. You can go to the next slide. We are at a very different place in Oregon on this, is on this journey toward transformation of educational opportunities that we want to provide for the students of our state. The big change often happens as a result of conversation that leads to action. One of those conversations happened in the fall of 2012 right here in Iowa. The state board held a panel with the, question, the final question being, is there anything else you would like to tell the state board? Ron Fielder, who was one of the area education chiefs at the time, said yes. You need to seriously investigate competency-based education, and the first step would be to get Fred Bramante to come and talk with you about what's happening in New Hampshire. And they did. It became a state board priority at that point and has remained a priority since. This is important because when the state board sets their priorities, we get our marching orders at the department. So during the first year, we created a task force and developed state guidelines, held a day-long forum to bring together schools from across the state who were interested in CBE. When we had asked them to sign up in teams of four, had, when we had room for 20, 300 people, interest was so high that registration closed in less than three hours. That year, we asked the legislature to eliminate the Carnegie unit as the basis for credit, as the only basis for credit in Iowa high schools. They responded positively and also asked for a task force to investigate the things that are listed here on the, on the slide. These were their ideas and really a gift to us since it established a set group to investigate and a deadline for an official report. One report was due in January of this year, the preliminary report, and then the final report is in November. Next slide, please. One of the things that we felt we needed right away was a document that gave us common language. The process started with an internal team to outline what should be included. Then. I had several conversations with leaders of this work in Alaska, New Hampshire, and Colorado. One of the fascinating aspects of this process has been the willingness of everyone to share their work and their successes and setbacks. Once the document was written, I vetted it with Doug Penn in Alaska, Paul Leather in New Hampshire, Mike Sergero in Colorado, and then with Susan Patrick of Inagle. Finally, I sent the document to five educational leaders across Iowa and had a phone conversation with each, each, each of them. Basically, Ayala asked if they understood the document and if it was fulfilled its purpose, if they would be able to at least get started in their districts with that information, and if not, what would we need to add? One of the things we wanted to make very clear was that this is far more than mastery learning, which seemed like a check and move on system to most of the people on the task force. We believe that in order to demonstrate proficiency, students have to actually use the knowledge and skills in some performance task, not specifically for each standard, but for the competency, which will be written so that as to require the demonstration of 21st century skills as well as dispositions right along with the knowledge and skills associated with the standard. And proficiency means that students have been demonstrated the ability to continue to a higher level within that content area, not that they simply squeaked by. These are two foundational parts of competency base. Next slide, please. That legislative task force began in July of 2012 and filed that preliminary report, like I said, in January of this year. As a side note, I can tell you that this movement is being monitored. After the report posted, I got a call from a consultant at the Carnegie Foundation. She said that she had found our report to be compelling and purposeful. She wanted me to know that the Carnegie Foundation had felt for a long time that there has to be a better way to validate learning than by seat time. But until now, nothing had seemed like it could work. She said they're watching the CBE movement across the nation and believes this just might be it. Our report gave 22 recommendations outlining the work toward developing competencies and assessments, professional development, and data systems for recording and reporting. 
Most significantly, we requested that the legislature fund that work as well as up to 10 pilot districts, districts for the purpose of learning together what it takes to transform a system into a learner-centered professional learning environment, personalized learning environment. Uh, next slide, please. These are the three, there are really three levels of policy that need to be considered when you're working toward um, this kind of change. Two are at the state level, legislated code and administrative rule. We requested um, and received that main code change in 2012, eliminating the Carnegie unit as the only way to earn credit toward graduation. And I did recently find one minor code change that we will request for next year. However, the task force has been working as a group reviewing administrative rule and has made recommendations for those changes as well. Those have mostly focused on the definition of unit because it, has, was always, it was based on time or that Carnegie unit. We are, we're now being careful to word the proposed changes at this point so that schools, if they're not engaged with CBE, are still required to use the Carnegie unit as seat time. We didn't want it to become a free-for-all that they could just go out and do whatever they wanted and not be accountable. Local policy can sometimes um, truly be a local district policy that might be in place that inhibits transition. But there are also state and federal mandates that require attention to local, for local policymakers. For example, in Iowa, students are allowed to earn credit for high school before ninth grade, but there has to be a local policy allowing it. So in our state guidelines, we listed some of those things, including this one, so that schools would be sure that they would go back and check through their own local policy. Next slide, please. Our preliminary report was well received by the legislature. In fact, we have enjoyed bipartisan support in both houses. When the educational committee of each house asked for a presentation on the work, I took the opportunity to have teachers and students from Muscatine who have been involved in CBE do that presentation. Within 24 hours, I learned that the legislators were quoting those students. One representative had asked them if, what their parents thought of this change. A sophomore explained that at the beginning of the year, her mother met her at the door every day and riddled her with questions about that class. Was she really learning anything? What had they done? Did she have assignments? She said the questions continued until she locked herself in the room. But at this point, the presentation to the legislature, it was January, and now her mom wants to know why all of her classes are not competency-based education. Um, that's the kind of little vignette that will really get me up in the morning. Next slide, please. The Legislative Task Force will meet two more times, July 11th and September 19th, and that group will make final recommendations for future work, and then the Department of Education will take the lead. We see CBE as a way to develop the deeper learning required for our students to be college and career ready. So it has become our goal for the Innovation Lab Network, which you'll hear about later. Next slide, please. What we are talking about is transformational change in the way we think about and therefore how we engage in the art and science of education. It will undoubtedly involve fault starts and five steps and will take perseverance and dedication. So what keeps us motivated? This is it. I know that among other things, New Hampshire decreased, drop, decreased their drop, dropout rate from something like 2,900 statewide to 650 um, that, that's an incredible change. And Alaska transformed a culture of underachievement to one that sends students to college all up and down the West Coast. Next slide, please. But schools right in our own state are making great strides as well in creating environments in which students own their own learning and become so connected to what is happening in the school that they show up and participate and don't get sent to the office. And they are far more likely to be engaged at the upper levels of blooms than other students. In fact, the researcher who provided these stats after observing in Spirit Lake said that it is typical to find 75% of students engaged at the lower two levels of blooms. So a complete switch. Here again, it is important to point out the critical role of leadership. Dave Smith, the superintendent, toured a local egg plant and realized that they were not preparing students for the types of jobs that he had seen on that tour. He knew they needed something different and arranged for a group of his district educators to go to High Tech High in California with the hope that they would be inspired to bring about real change in Spirit Lake. Kari Webb was one of those educators. 
she dared to say, what if we start with three weeks? We would get educators to try anything, something, anything drastic, different for, 12, for three weeks. And the J-term was born, three weeks of project-based, day-long courses with low student-teacher ratios. About that time, I was sending out those guidelines that I talked about earlier to be vetted with some schools, and I happened to send them to Dave Smith, who gave them to Kari Webb. The Carnegie unit was still in effect, but they requested a waiver and became our first competency-based situation in Iowa. That was why a department researcher and I drove four and a half hours northwest in January to do some observations, which resulted in the data you see here. Absences were decreased by 35% and office referrals by over 75% when comparing three weeks in December to three weeks in January. Next slide, please. The January term excited teachers as well as students. Teachers said that they had worked harder than they ever had, but that it was worth it. They um, said they felt all felt like first year teachers again. And then I later found out that this student who um, said they didn't want a snow day was a boy whose mother was so concerned that she had come to school in August to say that she was going to need help to keep her son in school because he had hated it since kindergarten. And here it is January of that same year, and he does one snow day. And when, competent, and when community members heard about the amazing things that students had done in their internship during those three weeks, they wanted a piece of it too. I don't think there's ever been a better win-win situation in education. Next slide, please. That January term led to three teachers saying they didn't want to go back. They created a ninth grade core academy and team taught a third of the students at a time for two period blocks, 35 students, three teachers, and two cl three classrooms. They began calling them free range kids because they determined each day where they needed to be. The teachers developed cross-curricular projects. And I suppose you've already read ahead, but let's look at that last sentence. They didn't call it homework. It was because I was responsible to them, the other students. They couldn't just not do it. That's revolutionary and far more important than anything I can say about CBE. Next slide, please. Here at Lake Hugs, the Minnesota border, and Muscatine is on the Mississippi River, so we head east to look at a much larger district. Changing demographics and a growing dropout rate had Bill Decker, the superintendent, looking for ways to make a difference in the lives of their students. He made the same decision as Dave Smith and took a team to High Tech High. They were impressed enough to begin to bring professional development leaders from high tech to Muscatine and start their school, their school within a school called Global Generation or G Squared. It is a completely project-based environment. Then they attended the CBEN forum in December of 2011. They, their gifted coordinator joined the group to see if there might be something she could glean for her students. She went home inspired and provi to provide competency-based pathways for all students. Andrew Stewart has led that work in Muscatine and is now taking their third cohort of teachers through a background study and of planning. Uh, next slide, please. Spirit Lake and Muscatine are examples of what can happen when innovative leaders and hard, and hard work, if the state, will get out of the way. But we are excited to bring, to begin work on making things a bit more systemic and find out what we can do if we work together. As we define the recommendations to be made in January, we have a strategic plan that we do that, keep that in mind, that we can do this systemically and together. Our goal is to walk with the pilot schools to write some model competencies and assessments and determine what professional develop is needed for educators as well as how to engage parents and community. Our plan is that these pilot schools become our homegrown examples so educators from across Iowa in the Midwest don't have to fly from to one of the coasts to find quality examples of content-rich, student-centered, personalized learning. In the process, we hope to determine just what it means and what it takes for students to be college and career ready. As we move forward, we know two things are critical. We must find the appropriate recording and reporting systems very soon because this work is too complex to succeed using what our schools have today. And we must have our national partners like the American Youth Policy Forum, RHEL Midwest, the CCRS Center, and the ILN, as well as Oregon and other states on this journey. We need to be what we want our students to become, globally 
connected, engaged, and inspired learners who can apply what we learn to our students. Next slide, please. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that you might have now or if you want to email me after the webinar or actually later in the webinar when we um, take the questions. Thank you. Sandra, thank you so much. That was a great overview of the work in Iowa and um, interesting to compare and contrast how Iowa and Oregon have gone about this work. So um, I'm going, we are getting quite a number of questions from people. Um, so I'm going to pose a couple of questions to Diane and Sandra. Um, before we move to our final speaker. Um, and some of the questions have been coming in relate to assessments, which obviously are a very important um, topic and um, a critical piece of competency-based education. So I'm wondering if you could each uh, talk a little bit about um, what, what kind of assessments you're using for this work, if they've changed, and in particular, given the um, advent of the Common Core State Standards um, uh, approaching, um, how are your states thinking about uh, competency-based assessments linked to the Common Core? So, Diane, um, can I pose those questions to you and ask you to provide us your thoughts from Oregon? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I, I can report that there are far more common formative and summative assessments created by departments and by districts um, across the state as a result of using proficiency. And there are conversations about the implications of that data and how we can collect that at the state level. However, there is no system in place beyond the state assessments and the upcoming Common Core assessments that Oregon will participate in uh, that would be blanket across the state. The data uh, seems to be emerging um, in the same areas that Sandra identified in the number of students who are seeing success, uh, the number of standards that a student is able to be proficient in before moving on, but I would say that the benefit not only beyond what the students are able to see in knowing firmly what they know and can do is the collegial conversations that happen across professionals in terms of is this a good question, is it even a good test, does it ask the student to demonstrate what the standard expects, are we seeing the same level of rigor, um, is the work sufficient? Do we have enough evidence to even make a decision? Those are the kinds of questions that are beginning to emerge across teachers, and that's why I'm really delighted to see more common assessments. And Diane, just a quick follow-up. Um, how are uh, educators talking about the, these assessments um, that they're using uh, given the advent of the Common Core? Um, I think that in the last year with the almost 2,000 teachers that we've been working with, uh, with the exception of one or two remote districts, everyone has been moving to the Common Core standards and developing uh, questions consistent with where in the Smarter Balanced Consortium they're beginning to develop common assessments with questions that are consistent in depth and form to those that we see on the Smarter Balanced website so that the rigor that's expected uh, and the type of teaching that goes into the lesson prior to that assessment uh, is consistent with the Common Core. Great, that's very helpful, thank you. Um, Sandra, what are your thoughts from um, the work in Iowa uh, around assessments and um, different kinds of assessments that they're using and uh, connections to the Common Core? Well, of course, we're just getting started on this work, so our answers are more in theory. But one of the things that we're really looking at is what Rose Colby calls common scoring guides for uncommon assessments, because if we're really truly personalized in what's happening in the classroom, then we have the competency and we have the rubric that says this is what I need to have demonstrated, but that could be a very different thing from student to student or classroom to classroom as far as what actually happens for that assessment. We also are looking at what Intel Teach has to offer in their assessment. We're also an Intel state, 
and we're looking at their assessment um, professional development. They have a lot of quality rubrics that are available to all um, teachers and can be um, used, downloaded, tweaked in whatever way needs to be. And we're a Smarter Balance state, so we're working together with Smarter Balance on what kinds of assessments can be those summative assessments for um, competency-based and other things. There's a lot of work going on behind the scenes right now for that. Okay, super. Thank you, Sandra. Um, we've been getting um, several questions also about uh, the role of online learning in this work um, and to the extent that you either are using it or thinking about incorporating it in your work. So, Sandra, let me start with you. Um, is the online and blended learning a component of your uh, competency-based education strategies? Yes, it is. In fact, we have um, on, just created an online learning uh, advisory group for the state of Iowa and working very closely together. Uh, it's actually two separate groups, the task force for competency-based and this advisory for online. But those of us who are leading it are working very closely together. And then I might add that this, the group in um, Spirit Lake that had the three teachers working together created an online component as a part of their process there, so they had a blended learning for that ninth grade academy. And we, we continue to read that blended learning is probably the way we all need to be going. It's, it's what's um, bringing about the best results for students. All right, thank you. And Diane, what about online learning in your work with proficiency-based education? Yeah, I think this is really one of the emerging areas that is a surprise to uh, everybody in terms of how teachers who might not have been originally comfortable with um, technology are embracing online and blended learning. First of all, at the state level, we have something called the Oregon Virtual School District, which provides opportunities for courses and resources for teachers across the state at no cost. The second thing that we're seeing is that classroom teachers are beginning to develop websites and using resources for online opportunities to gain more practice before a student reassesses. It's really important that they see growth between point A assessment and point B assessment so that it doesn't become a revolving door. And teachers are turning to um, open source software such as Moodle and um, some others that fall into that category to create websites of practice for students. Um, the other thing that we're seeing is a lot more opportunity in the summer school arena and the January term for students who are not yet proficient in a course to only focus on the standards in which they are not proficient and by the time you have really strong interventions it might only get down to one standard or two that they need to focus on and for that schools are turning to online and blended opportunities so that the student can continue with a full class load and pick up, pick up the, um, the learning that they need to in one or two standard areas. Okay, great to hear. Thank you. Um, I have one more question for the two of you, and then we'll um, move on to our final speaker. But um, in this day of data and evaluation, I'm curious to hear how um, your states, respectively, are thinking about evaluating competency-based education or proficiency-based education. Um, as state leaders, um, administrators, whatever, how are you thinking about you know, determining um, the impact of competency-based education and evaluating um, its value. So, Diane, let me start with you on that question. That's, um, that's a tough question because I think for any state, it's states are in a position right now where they are collecting a lot of data. And if you look at, at least for Oregon, proficiency-based teaching and learning as a set of instructional and learning strategies that can happen in the classroom and out of the classroom, how do you gather all of those unique practices and say you're doing enough of them that we want to track your data? That's a tough basket to uh, open up. We do have something called achievement compacts. An achievement compact is uh, a common set of uh, achievement data across every district in the state as well as unique 
uh, data points that a district might identify and their school board is involved in that and that data is collected and evaluated to the degree that we can put that on one side of the table and look at whether that district is using proficiency-based practices on the other side of the table, I think we can see a cross match. But at this point beyond that, there is no formal effort to try and collect that information. Okay, and certainly understand this is an extremely complex type of intervention and hard to, hard to get your hands around it. Um, Sandra, uh -huh. what are you thinking of in Iowa? One of the conversations that we are beginning to have, which came out of one of our recommendations from the task force, is setting up a higher education committee working with the transitions to higher ed, with what will happen within the disciplines in the higher ed, and what happens in teacher college and administrator prep. But the other thing is that um, bringing them on board as our evaluators, these are the people who know how to do this. And um, so that's a conversation that's just beginning, and we feel like it's key that we bring higher ed into this immediately and um, are working with them for that, that part of it. Thanks. Well, great point about including higher ed in these conversations as well. Um, so let's, uh, let's move on. Thank you both for all of your um, Great ideas on the work that you're doing. Um, we're going to move now to our final presenter, uh, Carissa Miller, who's with the Council of Chief State School Officers. And Carissa is going to describe the Innovation Lab Network that you've heard a little bit about and that both Oregon and Iowa are a part of, and the policy issues that the 10 ILN states are exploring. Carissa, I'm turning it over to you. Thank you, and uh, thanks for inviting us to be here today. It's been uh, it's been great to listen to all of the information that's come out, and uh, Sandra and Diane have done a great job of explaining uh, what their states are doing. Um, so when I do some of the examples that I'm going to talk about, I'm going to um, probably not talk so much about Oregon and Iowa, although you can see that they're doing some great stuff. If we could move on to uh, my slides, just to give you kind of an idea of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's how the Innovation Lab Network is supporting communities of practice across member states to implement competency-based education within a broader framework of college and career readiness and personalized learning. So the ILN in and of itself it supports competency-based education, but it supports a lot more than that. So today I'm going to be pretty focused on just that aspect of it, um, but just to, to give you that context. I'm, I'm going to first start with an overview of the ILN. I'm going to talk about some state considerations. If you're thinking about how to um, involve your state in competency-based education, which you heard Kate say there are a number of states doing that, um, some, some advice we might have for you if you're interested, and then I'm going to do some examples. So we'll run through that pretty quickly. So in, in 2009, a number of state chief school officers came together with the shared belief that the public education system uh, needs to be transformed in order to prepare next generation learners to be college and career ready. They really started with the question, how does the classroom look different? What are the implications in that system? And CCSO responded by forming this Innovation Lab Network. It was a group of what uh, is now 10 states. It started with six, uh, taking collective action to identify, test, and implement student-centered approaches to learning. We had ILN partner states with designated districts and schools as innovation zones. You've heard a little bit about how um, Oregon and Iowa have started in, in certain places, and some of the states have called those innovation zones. For example, Kentucky has that main group from one district uh, to now having a, a much larger system, a statewide system. The goal of the ILN is to spur system level change by scaling locally led initiatives, both within and across states, and by creating enabling conditions through policy and implementation. You also heard Kate talk about how important it is to have that focused on policy, and, and we've definitely seen that meted out in some of the conditions that we're in. CCSSO facilitates cross-network action, collaboration, and shared learning around state resources and progress in creating an aligned system of policy and local practice. So we're going to move on to the next slide. So these are the six critical attributes um, that we've identified within our Innovation Lab Network. I'm just going to touch on three of them that are related to uh, competency-based education. Number two, the performance-based learning. This puts students at the center of the learning process by enabling the demonstration of mastery based on high, clear, and commonly shared expectations. 
So that's one element of what we see in our ILN experience and also feeds nicely into competency-based education. Uh, the next one I want to highlight is the anytime, everywhere opportunities. Um, you've been discussing that throughout this presentation about online learning, some of those examples, but our principle on that is uh, online, or excuse me, anytime, everywhere opportunities which provide and credentialing learning experiences in all aspects of the child's life through both geographic and the technology-enabled learning communities. So that could take a couple of different aspects. And the last uh, element that I'm going to point out is student agency. We really think it's important that what we're doing here is done with and for the students rather than to. Um, it's a deep engagement of students in directing and owning their individual learning and shaping the nature of their education experience among their peers. So we'll move on to the next slide. So these are the considerations that we'd like to put out for discussion about uh, implementing competency-based education. Through our work with the ILN states, there are several key elements that have emerged from states um, that they might want to consider. We've evolved these elements into aligned action sets for states with, re with respect to competency-based education. The first one is to define. States must take formal action to define college and career read ready more broadly to include knowledge, skills, and disposition. This serves as a goal statement for the system from which key competencies for, from students can be derived. The second is that states must take action to set the conditions that enable competency-based education. Let me give you just a few examples. Waiving seat time requirements and creating competency-based diplomas. Implementing individualized learning plans for all students. Adopting an online system for monitoring student progress. Awarding credit for out-of-school or extended learning opportunities that align with key competencies. Preparing educators to thrive in competency-based technology-enabled environments and rewarding educators for doing so. And third, states must adopt a balanced system of assessment, the question that we were just having, that includes not only valid and reliable assessments of the Common Core, but also performance-based assessments in areas beyond the Common Core, as well as formative assessments or cross-curricular competencies. This is the idea of deeper learning, which our funder, the Hewlett Foundation, uh, really strives to help underpin in all of what we do. Fourth, we think that uh, states must consider how its accountability system aligns with or acts as a barrier against competency-based environments. Issue, issues such as metrics used which competencies count. Let me give you an example. So if you have a dual system where you're still counting Carnegie units, um, these, these systems can work against each other where one might uh, be incentivizing a, a system where you know, competency-based education isn't being incentivized. And lastly, these competencies themselves must have meaning in the context of college and career readiness. Uh, this started to come up, you were starting to talk about institutes of higher education and the workforce must endorse the definition of college and career readiness from which the competencies are derived and must accept or prefer the competency-based credits or diploma. If you think about it, um, we we do all of this in K-12, we, we build these great systems where competency-based learning is prolific and it's doing a wonderful thing for our students and then they get to, to higher ed. And if it's not, if we're not making that connection, if we're not moving it across that, that barrier between K-12 and higher ed, it's really uh, not going to be nearly as effective and will um, could be detrimental to our students. So we really believe that this last one is a, is a pretty powerful and important piece. Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. So these are the ILN states. Uh, Kate had a great slide, and I love that slide where she had our ILN states uh, shaded in, but uh, also showed some of the other states that are doing some work in this. And I, I just like to say too that there are other states working in this area. These happen to be the states that are working in the Innovation Lab Network, so we're highlighting those today. So I'm just going to give you some examples from a few of these states on each one of these categories. So under define, for example, uh, New Hampshire, Maine, and Oregon um, have each defined college and career readiness to include the Common Core as well as broader knowledge, skills, and dispositions, and have established a set of key competencies or essential skills as the goalposts for their students. So that would be the, the first one in define. Under enable, uh, the Maine legislature passed 
1422, which requires all districts to offer a proficiency-based diploma of all standards and all disciplines in, by 2018, as well as identifying standards and criteria for assessment. Uh, also under ENABLE, Kentucky's districts of innovation will develop a competency-based pathways and graduation requirements based on authentic, anytime, anywhere learning and demonstrations of mastery. Under MEASURE, all of our ILN states are working to advance balanced systems of assessment and are planning to implement the Common Core State Standards Consortia Assessment. Many are participating in what the ILN has called the Consortium Plus. This is a group that's been working with Linda Darling-Hammond and Ray Pichon to develop a rich performance task and state to local policy and implementation guidance for performance-based assessments of competency-based uh, education. Under a hold accountable, New, uh, this has already been mentioned, but New Hampshire really leads the way with its ESEA waiver in which it has embedded performance assessment tasks in its assessment system and accountability measures. And I'm going to come back to that in just a minute and tell you one of the things that we're working on here. The last thing is make meaningful. Uh, Maine and New Hampshire, along with the other New England uh, secondary school consortium states, have secured a pledge from 49 New England institutions of higher education endorsing proficiency-based approaches to instruction, assessment, reporting, and graduation, and acceptance, without disadvantage, of proficiency-based transcripts. Even another example of that is Southern New Hampshire's University College of America is actually uh, using a competency-based approach to course credit. So going back just to the whole accountable when we're talking about the waivers, for example, uh, one of the things that uh, CCSSO is working on right now with these ILN states, we'll start uh, in a month meeting, is how when the waiver renewals come out, we can help states build into their waivers ways in which to support uh, competency-based education using drawing off of New Hampshire's experience, but also building that out so that uh, it can be one of the things that will help inspire this kind of work. Uh, you know, we also use uh, communication tactics such as st study tours, um, blog posts, and so forth to keep states energized and make advocates out of our key stakeholder groups. Um, as the, as uh, the people who have gone before me have said, it's, it's really critical and important to get uh, your advocates who see how important this is and, and the, the stories about the parents um, really make a huge difference, I think. so. I think that with that, I'm going to end here and uh, I'll put it back to Betsy. Oh, I just would uh, highlight that Jennifer Davis is actually our director of the Innovation Lab Network and is a great resource. Um, I will do my best to answer your questions today, but Jennifer is really uh, the best person to do that and it would be happy to take questions offline if there are some, but uh, she was unable to attend today. So, Betsy, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you, Carissa, and um, thanks to you and all of your staff for the work that you do on the Innovation Lab Network. Um, just a word regarding questions. Um, we will try to send out uh, some of the questions that have come in from the audience that we might not have a chance to get to, uh, to some of the presenters, and we will post responses uh, on the website. And just a reminder, all of the slides and audio portion of the, web, of the webcast will be on our website, along with numerous resources that have been mentioned um, by the presenters and contact information and websites. So um, return to our webpage and you'll get lots of other resources about this topic. So I do want to take um, a couple questions now at the end. We have about um, between 15 and 20 minutes and we've had a, quite a number of questions on different topics uh, come in from folks. So I'm going to uh, try to go through them as much as quickly as we can. Um, I'd, I'd like to just run through the panel that we have starting with Kate, uh, going to Diane, Cassandra, and Carissa. And if um, if you feel like you have nothing to say, just say I'll pass. And Joe Harris, I know you're still on the call. Um, some of these items you may also want to comment on. So the first question that we have gotten from numerous people uh, relates to out of school time learning, after school and out of school time learning and how um, either states or school districts or schools are thinking about uh, using the out-of-school time hours uh, to um, 
to allow young people to develop competencies and then how to um, ensure that they get credit for that for what's learned outside of school. So Kate, can I get your thoughts on that please? Sure. First of all, I think that's a really great question and um, a crucial population to tap into. So I'm glad that the question is being asked. Um, I, I will leave the, most of the answer to this to our state people, but, but just to start it off, I think it's crucial to um, have professional development that spans the after-school and in-school communities so that everyone is on the same page, um, and obviously eliminating seat time, credit time measures will help think more creatively and push a more creative agenda on how students can earn different credit. Um, but going back to the professional development, to make sure that everyone's on the same page and students are earning credit for really quality work in the after school environment that they're getting, it's really crucial that um, all of the adults are working together to ensure continuity. Great. Thank you, Kate. And I think um, that the idea of combined professional development is great. And then just you said um, ensuring that it's high quality. Um, experiences outside of school so if Diane and Sandra and Carissa can also be thinking about how do you ensure that out of school time learning um, is high quality and meets education standards but Diane your thoughts on how to uh, involve the after school out of school time world in the in proficiency based education please yes and um, we have uh, some extensive experience in this area in Oregon because of the uh, credit waiver option that's been in place for high schools. The high quality of the experience is ensured through the components that allow the student to earn credit. First of all, there's policy that states that you have a course syllabus or uh, something that defines what are the standards the student must demonstrate, what is the level of proficiency that's expected, what are the uh, what are the occasional meetings that are going to take place between the uh, person supervising the learning in the field, the person who's going to be the teacher of record, and the student. That has to all be set down on paper, and everybody has to come to the table and agree what's going to happen. We have had um, experiences, uh, I'll give you one example because you can plug in your own content area, a student who is in a youth symphony. The high school doesn't have a youth symphony program. Student clearly spends after school and weekend hours in this activity with a music teacher of record who understands the national music standards with the violin um, first chair and the youth symphony assistant conductor sit down, get everything on paper with the T's crossed and I's dotted and then there are periodic checks on how the student is doing with regards to those standards. When the student has demonstrated the standards the credit is awarded. Sometimes it has to be held in a bucket until the end of a grading period depending on how close the student is to that artificial calendar date. But we have uh, uh, after school and um, weekend and summer experiences uh, allowing our students to earn credit with that kind of structure to it. That's great to hear. Thank you, Diane. Um, Sandra? We actually have two ways that we've begin to look, begun to look at this. And one of them is an official way, similar to what um, Diane just explained in Oregon, where there would be plans and checks and um, demonstrations, for example, in a um, in an internship that's specifically set up between the school and a, a place in the community where those there would be that communication all along the way. But then there's the unofficial ways that students are learning and things like the Scouts or the 4-H where, for example, someone might learn to sew in amazing ways when they're working with their 4-H person and this is not, an, not a licensed educator, but um, definitely the person has, the student has learned. And, then what we require is that it has to be a licensed Iowa teacher, licensed in the area that the credit is being awarded, who determines how will I know the student is proficient and is the student proficient. So then that educator can award credit based on those connections with the competencies and because it's a licensed teacher. 
That's a great um, description. Good to hear that. Um, Carissa, do you have any thoughts? I, just a couple of thoughts about the, the, the reframing of the thinking or your definitions really need to change when you think about it in this way, that it's, it's so much more on the front end work defining the things that uh, I think it was Diane was talking about, the, um, the syllabus, the, what, what's going to show demonstration of, of competency or proficiency. It's, it's all of that rather than on the back end saying that we put in this many, many hours. I mean, it's a focus on competency. And I would say that there's assessment plays a key role in that and building an assessment that can show um, competency. So. Great. Thank you. Thanks for your thoughts. And Joe has said he'll pass on this question. Um, one of the other areas that we've gotten a lot of questions about is um, competency-based education and career and technical education. It seems to me that there are some very natural intersections between CTE uh, and demonstration of proficiency and competency. So I'm wondering, again, if we can go down the list with Kate, Diane, Sandra, and Carissa. Um, your thoughts on how those connections can be made and then perhaps some examples from states that you're familiar with. So Kate, first to you. Sure. Um, I don't know that I have a huge amount of information to add uh, on this front other than to say that there are clear overlaps and, and it's a really important area to delve into. Um, in terms of preparing students to take on what they want to do and be prepared for post-secondary uh, career training, um, I, I think it's competencies are a great way to fill out the educational um, background and skill set um, so students can get tapped into something they're really interested in and excited about and that also links up with after school it can be great after school opportunities um, that fit with the CTE agenda um, so I'd, I'll be curious to hear um, from Sandra and Diane about what they're doing on that great thank you uh, Diane yes thank you Oregon has a handbook which I'd be happy to send and have you um, distribute called Applied Academics. It spells out how a career and technical education environment can offer uh, credit in either um, the content area of the career and technical standards, the, the industry standards that the course has to be aligned to, or another area. And to give you an example, there was a group that came together in the uh, eastern part of the state where ag science is a particular um, career and technical education class and they discovered by going through the standards in the ag science program that there was an, an eligible, a valid eligible percentage of biology credit that could be given for that. When something like that happens or when you can give uh, credit for um, a math a set of math standards in a construction class or um, some people are getting some credit because there are some math standards in an auto mechanics class. We have some policy guidelines that districts have to follow, that being that you have to follow the highly qualified status for the teacher, that you must have clearly defined standards that the student understands they need to reach, that there is a, a good assessment system, that there is agreement around the sufficiency of evidence, and that the teacher who is the content area specialist in something other than career and technical is at the table contributing judgments to whether those standards are being met or not, because that person has the expertise in that particular field. So it does involve some juggling, and I would say uh, in connection to what Carissa mentioned mo a few minutes ago, it is mostly upfront work that has to be done, but this handbook has an, a tremendous set of Q&A that spell out how that can happen, and I think there are a number of Oregon schools that are making it work really well. That's super, and if you uh, send us a link to that handbook, we'll make sure that it gets posted on the website, so thank you very Perfect. much. Uh -huh. Okay. Sandra? I will be excited to have that handbook because, as you know, we're kind of holding on to Oregon's coattails, as I've said. So, But one thing, it's very similar to what Diane said. We're looking at things like science and ag, and those things are together. And right now in Iowa, if you happen to be licensed in science and in ag, then you can give either credit for the course. 
However, under a clear competency-based system, then um, if there are definite competencies that are being um, addressed in an ag class that would fit under, for example, biology, like Diane said, if there's sufficient evidence and the content teacher is at the table, someone who has that, that um, license to teach biology, then credit can be awarded. But as I said before, it has to be the licensed teacher who um, is making those decisions and giving that credit. And then it's a case where someone actually could be earning credit in ag and in biology if they're, if they're actually um, demonstrating proficiency on all those standards. Thank you, Sandra. That's great to hear. Um, Carissa, your thoughts on CTE and competency-based ed? Uh, yeah, it, so I, I do know that um, beyond what uh, was just mentioned, uh, California has been working on this. I don't have any specific examples of this, but I do know that they have been embedding what they're, the work they're doing in the ILN in their career and technical education division. Um, and so that's been an important part of the work that they're doing. I will have to get more information. But the other thing that the ILN has been working on is Dave Connolly's work out of Epic in Oregon, um, where we focus on not just knowledge and those competencies, but skills and dispositions. So skills are like collaboration, critical thinking, communication, creativity, and dispositions are initiative, agency, grit, perseverance. Those kinds of things um, work well when we're talking across the whole spectrum rather than just um, for example, you know, at college and career ready. But it, so, those are just some things that I would that I would add that I think are important elements. Great, thanks for adding that, Carissa. Um, we have a few more minutes, so I'm going to wrap up with a final question to the panel, um, and. Again, we'll go Kate, Diane, Sandra, and Carissa. Um, so if you had to give some advice to some of your fellow state education policy leaders on developing or implementing competency-based education, uh, what one or two uh, action items would you suggest or um, you know, share with your fellow peers around the states? So Kate, where would, you, where would you suggest that other state leaders begin on this work? Good question. Um, I would suggest looking at the, the human capital structure and who's filling what roles in schools. And, and I don't mean that to be solely teachers. I think we need to look at everyone who's involved in educating the youth um, and have them look at different roles that adults are taking um, and how they can be complementary to each other. Um, and then how to learn along with students to make sure that adults are learning in the same way that we're asking students to learn because I think that's sometimes a, um, a difficult shift to make and the adults should have to grapple with it as well. So <laughs> definitely looking at the human capital side of things, um, looking at that. And then the other piece that I would suggest looking at is making sure that the assessments and accountability are measuring what we're intending and we're not using assessments to, to measure something different um, than is intended. We're not holding teachers accountable um, for on an assessment that that doesn't measure what we're what we're looking precisely at. Um, so limit limiting those two buckets to the intention intentional purpose um, to make sure that we're getting out of them what we need. Okay, great points, Diane. What are your thoughts? Yes, I, I want to start with something similar to what Kate just finished with. I had a chance to review a health test and the teacher had put at the top of the test, uh, anticipating that she was moving to a proficiency environment, that 84% was proficient and she had 42 questions. They were all objective. Each question was worth two points. If you got all 42 questions right, you earned 84 points. You could skip the three short answer essay below and you could have enough points to say that you were proficient. But the standard that she was measuring started with justify. And it was clearly a misalignment between the assessment and the standard. And in Oregon, this is probably the 
uh, longest sustaining teacher driven initiative that we have ever seen and because it's teacher driven they are looking at an environment of changing what teaching and learning looks like and whether it happens outside the classroom or in the classroom uh, at night or during the day in the summer or during a vacation my suggestion is that we focus on the sustainable factors of teaching and learning that bridge all age groups all classrooms all content areas that's how the sustainable change occurs the components that we find getting in the way, such as defining the role of homework versus practice, um, having to grade, having to report, the use of zeros, those are things that come about, sadly, sometimes first in a conversation with teachers, but it's an amazing transformation when you can put those kind of factors aside and make sure that something like the test that didn't measure the right stuff can be addressed after the mentality of teaching and learning changes. That helps strengthen the partnership between pre-service programs and higher education and the public school and that's what we're going for is the sustainability of practice. Great. Thank you, Diane. Sandra, your advice to your fellow state policymakers. First of all, I would agree with both of those and then I would add to that that um, be very careful to make sure that the goal is the college and career ready student not competency-based education. Competency-based education is the vehicle to get there, but the goal is those students are really ready for school, uh, ready for life. Um, and, and I would say then do some common reading. Process together. Um, if you can do two books, do Delivering on the Promise that gives you the Chugesh Alaska experience and do Off the Clock. Um, by Rose Colby and Fred Bramante about what's happened in New Hampshire and um, Diane Smith's book that she had pictures up, up there is, is a, another quality thing. Um, competencyworks.org has many white papers um, and then um, I would offer up our guidelines and our preliminary report since I've gotten some pretty high national praise on, on them being pretty well thought out and then just conversation, begin to ask the kinds of questions that you want to answer. Find out what it is that you really want for your students in your situation and, um, and, and begin those conversations with some common vocabulary. Great suggestions. Um, Carissa, you have the last word in our final minute. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I'm looking at this from a state level. And I guess I would say that it needs to be a systems change. So not thinking about it as a one-off or a one-time opportunity. It can't just be competency-based initiative. Um, as uh, Sandra just said, it has to be built into policy and practice together. You need to capitalize on systems that are moving quickly. When I talked about some of the work that we're doing on the waiver renewals, we see that as a really great vehicle to move along this policy. Um, without it being siloed as just another good practice. Um, you could look at Common Core uh, implementation as being a vehicle for that, where you're talking about the two systems together. Maybe the race to the top states are implementing it that way. And state initiatives. If your state in is bringing an initiative forward, it should include this competency-based education as a vehicle, um, as I believe Sandra said. So uh, I think the successful places we've seen are where it's integrated into the holistic of the state policy. So I would end great. with that. Okay, that's great. And uh, I, I appreciate everybody's uh, thoughts about sharing. I have to say there's a great deal of sharing going on in, the, um, in this area of work right now and people have been very willing to um, talk to others across the state, districts and schools about best practices and what we're all learning. So I think the field is very willing to learn from each other and move forward. So uh, thank you to all of our speakers for your excellent presentations and providing a uh, great deal of really important information. Um, just a reminder, all of the webinar and slides and other resources will be up on the AYPF website in the next day or two. Uh, and please remember to complete the survey as you exit. And lastly, uh, join us on July 16th for another webinar uh, when we will be talking about how school districts are implementing competency-based education. Thank you again for your time today. <laughs>